Good afternoon, everyone. Today is Sunday. It's April 21st. It's good to see you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being here. Today I've decided to record this video outside among the spring flowers that are popping up all over this property. At the end of the video, I'll try to take some pictures and uh, post them at the end of the video. I don't know why, but they just seem extra special this year and just um, so pretty. And I've, I've mentioned it before, but we live on Abe's grandparents' property. And when they were alive, his grandmother planted flowers all over the place and they just surprise us and delight us and um, you know I, I'm sure it was much more amazing when she was alive but there's still evidence of all that work that she put in all over the place and it's pretty neat. Today Abe and his dad and Asa are out planting trees every year his dad brings over hundreds of trees and they go around and this time of year they plant them all over the property and some of them make it some of them don't. Um, but it's some, a tradition that they do each year, so they're out doing that. You might see them in the background, I don't know, they're somewhere close by. Um, I'm also kind of near the road, so hopefully traffic is light and it doesn't get too loud. So last night we had our uh, evening home church meeting, and usually we have that Sunday evenings, but for various reasons we had it at home church last night. And uh, before I say the Lord's Prayer here, something pretty neat happened. We uh, we have been talking a lot about forgiveness and been reading week after week different scriptures on forgiveness and we've talked about at the end of the Lord's Prayer how it says with the Lord's Prayer you know paired with that it says uh, to forgive others or we will not be forgiven and how important that is you know that the Lord said that you know we have to forgive others or, or we're not going to receive his forgiveness it's kind of a big deal we've talked about that a lot and something that we've been talking about with some some close friends is just the difference between repentance and forgiveness and reconciliation they're all kind of different things we've been studying those different aspects um, and the awesome thing about God is he didn't stop at forgiveness you know he reconciled us back as sons and daughters and uh, he he restored relationship with us through the Holy Spirit and his presence has been restored to his people and just really starting to understand that in deeper and deeper ways. Um, I think most of my life I spent living in the forgiveness portion and um, the salvation level and uh, not really exploring the and stepping into the reconciliation part, the relationship part, the, the, the awesome treasures that he has for us because he has restored his presence to us and uh, just it's been awesome journey in that in that way with the Lord and just getting to know him and uh, enjoying the fullness you know at, the, at this point there's even more fullness you know there's it's, there's always more but enjoying more fully the reconciliation of relationship and the the restoring of relationship with the Lord so last night, the man that was leading the discussion, he uh, wrote a bunch of scriptures on forgiveness and index cards, and we just drew a scripture, and we were to read that and, and share in our own words what we felt like the Lord was saying about that scripture. And I received a word on Saturday afternoon. I was just sitting quietly with the Lord and uh, asking him for some wisdom and guidance about some financial stuff issues and uh, he just kind of interrupted me and um, said I want you to uh, give this word to the church and so I was like okay so I you know got up got a piece of paper and just uh, wrote down what, what he had to say and I did share it with the church last night and I shared it with the church this morning but in that word it talked about redemption and so I spent some time just you know uh, looking into the word redemption and, and thinking about it and so when we got to church last night it was kind of neat because the scripture I drew was Ephesians 1 7 and it talked about redemption and then the the scripture leading up to it talked about sonship and uh, explaining some of that and so I was just like enjoying the Lord and just what he was doing and uh, a woman shared she got the scripture about when Peter asked the Lord how many times do I forgive and the Lord said 70 times 7. Well, another thing that happened is uh, before I went to church Saturday night, I watched this really short teaching on um, the Hebrew meaning of 70 times 7. And it was really neat. And so I just want to share that with you. 
because I feel like the Lord's zeroing in on a few things before we go into the Lord's Prayer today. You know, he's asked us to say the Lord's Prayer and to think deeply about it. And so he keeps, keeps giving us these areas of focus uh, to think about the Lord's Prayer differently and all the layers of meaning that he has in that perfect prayer when he taught his disciples to pray. And uh, so this, this uh, rabbi, he was pointing out that um, he must be a Messianic Jew, you know, he knows Jesus. And he was pointing out that in that prayer, Jesus uh, paired together the daily bread and forgiveness. It says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And so forgiveness and daily bread are, are, are side by side. And so he, he goes on to say, and I took a, a few notes on this, uh, that there's a, a deeper spiritual lesson hidden in, in some of this. And uh, so at the Lord's Supper, you know, it's almost Passover. And at the Lord's Supper, Jesus broke the matzah, the unleavened bread. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And it's amazing to me, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a Seder meal. But um, I have with some people who uh, practice their messianic and um, they understand Jesus and they see all the symbolism in the, in the Seder meal, in the Passover meal. And it's, it makes me sad, you know, that there's a lot of people out there that, that celebrate this and don't see Jesus in it. And uh, he's all over it. But in the matzah, um, the bread is actually striped. It's got grooves and it, stripes in it, and it's pierced. And Jesus broke that bread and said, This is my body broken for you. And we know in scripture that he said that he is the bread of life. And in other videos, we've talked about how Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And in Hebrew, that is called Beit Lechem, which means house of the bread. And uh, we've talked about that. And I think that everyone or most of you at least know that the Hebrew language is very complex and very awesome and very deep and very perfect um, and that it it's alphanumerical so that means that each letter also has a, a numerical value and so when you look at the numerical value of house of bread uh, the, the number is 490 and nativity the word nativity in Hebrew equals 490 and the word tamim which means to be perfect or complete jesus was the perfect and complete sacrifice for our sins um that number is 490 so when peter asks how many times do i forgive and jesus says 70 times 7 which is 490 he was pointing to all of these things and the word of god is so perfect you know it has so many cross references and such deep meaning and treasure for us to discover and so he was basically seeing, saying that he is the bread of life. Uh, the number is 490. And you can't be perfect or complete unless you extend the bread of forgiveness to other people. And this man in the lecture said that withholding bread is like telling a starving person to go and die. And so as we say the Lord's Prayer, let's just think about the bread of life and the importance of forgiveness. And... Um, I guess before we do that, I also want to say at church last night, we talked about, you know, what is true worship? And we talked about the woman, Mary Magdalene, when she went, she heard that Jesus was at a Pharisee's house having a banquet, having a meal with the Pharisees. And she went and she showed up and she stood behind his feet and she just wept. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and kiss his feet and dry his feet with her hair. And um, the Pharisees, you know, were saying, if you were a prophet, you would know what a sinner this woman is. And they were, they were disgusted at, at her behavior. And she broke the perfume and all of that. And, um, and Jesus said, Simon, I have something to teach you. And Simon said, okay, go ahead. And he said, you know, if there's two men who owe a banker, money. One owes 500 coins and the other owes 5 or 50 coins. And, and the banker says that both of your debts are forgiven. Which one will love the banker more? And he said, well, I suppose the one who had the greater debt, the 500 coins. And Jesus said, you, you have 
uh, guessed correctly, yes, that's true. And he said, you know, when I came in, she washed my feet with tears and you didn't even have any water to wash my feet. And she greeted me by, she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. And you didn't even greet me with a kiss. And, uh, you know, he said, too much, to whom much has been forgiven. You know, they're going to have more love for, for, for God, for Jesus. And so just recognizing the depth of our sin and the magnitude of our sin, when we have an honest evaluation, when the Holy Spirit can give us an honest evaluation of ourselves and, and the, the need for forgiveness, you know, when we go there and really receive forgiveness and see the reality of what Jesus has forgiven, then we love him even more. And isn't that a true reflection of, of our worship and what we offer him in response uh, to, to receiving much forgiveness? And so when we receive much forgiveness, we have much forgiveness to offer to others. And, you know, that was the hardest thing with the Pharisees was um, the, the biggest enemy of the Lord was the hard hearts, the ones that could not come to realize their own spiritual depravity. You know, we're all really in the same boat. There isn't any one who is better. Um, all, of, all of our best efforts, no matter who we are, are filthy rags to the Lord. And we just really have to come to an honest place of that self-evaluation and, and really uh, self-awareness and to really just understand the truth of that. So as we say the Lord's Prayer, let's just think about that today. And so, uh, Father in heaven, you alone are holy. We pray that your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. Okay, so before I get to this word, there was a couple things that um, the Lord was kind of pouring into me that I didn't really see until I received this word. And so, like I said, I was, I was just uh, having a little quiet time with the Lord before going grocery shopping the other day and just seeking him on a few things. Um some wisdom and some counsel and, and he responded with this word to share with the church and in the word it talks about tithing and I started to see that the Lord was teaching me about tithing and one of the first assignments that he gave to me was um, to consider tithing and Melissa what do you have to tithe to me um, I want you to write that out I want you to think about that and so I spent some time thinking about what do I have to offer the Lord and um, so this word kind of reminded me of that early on in this journey. I, I think there's a video on it. I'm not sure. It's in one of my notebooks, one of my binders. And um, the other morning, Abe came into the bedroom excited, saying uh, that he just saw something that he thought would make a great skit for church sometime. And uh, he's going to tell me that I butchered this because he always says, <laughs> I'm like, do you want to get on here and, and say it for yourself? And he's like, no. Um, but I'll do my best. Um, he's sharing this story about this rich man um, having a conversation with Jesus. And this rich man was in some trouble and he just cried out to the Lord. And the Lord met him and said, you know, I, I want you to give me your, your finances. And uh, so he pulls out his wallet and he takes out all the cash. He gives it to the Lord. And he says, I want you to give me your home and your car. So he pulls out the keys to his home, the keys to his car. He puts it in the Lord's hand. He says, I want you to give me your family. So he pulls out a picture of his family from his wallet, hands it to the Lord. And he says, now I want you to give me all of you. And the man's thinking, I have given you all of me. This is everything that I have. I don't have anything else. Lord, what more do you require from me? And he thought about it. And then he's like, okay, fine. And he took off his shirt. You can have all of me. And he gave it to the Lord. And the Lord took all those things and handed them back to him. And he said, I just want you to know that all of this belongs to me. Now steward it well. And um, I was like, wow, that's awesome. That was an awesome illustration of tithing. And um, at, the, at the time he shared it with me, I wasn't thinking about tithing until I received this word from the Lord. And then later that evening, Abe had watched... Uh, 
uh, a lecturer, I think his name is John Revere, or Bavere, I forget if it's an R or a B, maybe some of you have heard of him, but he has a lot of teaching on the, the topic of forgiveness and reconciliation, and uh, just really good stuff that, that uh, we've been watching. Uh, but this one was a lecture on the wilderness, which really helped my husband so much, um, and it helped me too. I shared it with a couple of friends, and they're like, wow, that was so timely, and that like it was just what I needed. And um, so I'll put that in the notes if you want to watch that uh, lecture. But basically, he was saying that the wilderness experience is a necessary part of our faith journey, because what the Lord does is he... Um, gives us a promise but then we have a wilderness experience to develop character so that we have what it takes so he establishes in us character to be able to walk and step into the promise that he's given us and really nothing can get in our way of that except for ourselves not saying yes and uh, not learning the lessons in the wilderness and not following him and and so the wilderness experience, what it does is it uh, brings to our attention the things that God already knows are, are deep inside of us, our fears, our confusion, our doubt, our complaining spirits, um, you know, our rebellion, our idol worship, all those things, you know, come to the surface so that we can repent of those and he can skim them out of there. And he gave the story, uh, the illustration of the story of Joseph, how Joseph and his immaturity was given this great promise and really nothing got in Joseph's way. God even used, uh, you know, the, the schemes of the enemy, what his brothers meant for evil, God used for good. And he used all of it to bring about the very promise that the Lord established in him. But it took him years to develop the character, some major wilderness experience to develop the character to be able to step into that grand promise that the Lord gave him. And um, I was like, wow, that puts things into perspective, doesn't it? And um, so the challenge is, you know, the Lord, he gives us a promise. And we can stand on those promises. Like he's never going to leave us or forsake us. So those times in the wilderness when we feel, feel abandoned, he wants us to remember the promise. And he, he wants us to pay attention to those fears and those things that come up and to be willing to offer them to him as in our life to him as a sacrifice lord i don't understand how this is going to come about but i know that you are faithful and you're true and that you are you are a god of promises and that this will come to pass and to, to still stand on on the solid rock of his uh promise and so in that teaching a woman for the she was connecting something that happened to her in her in her life with the Lord that was like resonating with what he was teaching and she said that she was in um, a restaurant just living life you know with her family and it sounded like maybe her adult son got up to use the restroom she's kind of watching him go and just you know in the restaurant all of a sudden everything went black and she was just alone with the Lord she was having a vision right there he just interrupted everything and just surrounded her with his presence and said what do you have to offer me and she said that she saw her entire life and she saw all the wrestling and the doubt and the disobedience and the arguing and the complaining and the fear that she had. And she just saw it all as wasted time. And then she saw the moments where she actually stood in faith of his promises and stood on solid rock and obeyed. And those were the things that she had to offer the Lord. And she realized there wasn't many, there wasn't much of that. And so she just cried out to him, Lord, redeem this. Give me more opportunity. She said her flesh didn't want it, but her spirit was crying out. Lord, give me more opportunities to stand in faith and to obey you so that I have an armload of offering to offer you one day. And so when I received this word about tithing, I was like, wow, I think that's what he's trying to uh, teach me about is tithing. And to share these these things, these illustrations with everyone. And um, on the way to church, I was just asking my friend, I was like, well, how would you describe tithing? How would you describe how uh, we're to tithe 10%? What does that mean to you? 
And she said, what it means to me is that everything actually, well, without even telling you these things, she said, everything that we have actually belongs to the Lord and we offer all of it to him and he gives us 90% back, keeps 10% for himself, himself. And I was like, okay, I agree with that. I think that is the lesson. And so um, I just wanted to give you that background before I read this word because I feel like it goes with it. This is the, the word that I read uh, this morning to my church and last night. I love you, my children. I'm going to give you instructions. I want you to bring your tithes to me. I want you to give me your hearts. I do not want you to fear the coming days. I want you to remember my name. I am a strong tower. The righteous run to me and are safe. Listen to these words. They are faithful and true. My servant is listening to me, and she has been given this, these words to share with you today. You are going to begin to hear me for yourselves. You are going to begin to seek me in the dark and find me there waiting to shelter you under my wing. Listen, dear ones, the days are going to turn to night, but the dawn will spring forth. You will soon see that I have a plan and a season for your awakening. You will become the city on the hill. You will soon become the light of the world. I am moving and I am preparing and I am going to deliver on every promise. You will soon see that the time of my coming is at hand. I am the one true God and I have spoken these words to you. Do not fear these words, but rejoice. The day of your redemption is at the door. You are mine and I am yours. Do not be afraid. So the Lord's given me a list of messages to release today that were from a while back. Um, that I've just been waiting. Some of them I wasn't sure on and I uh, just kind of put them on a shelf and said, Lord, if this is from you, I know you'll confirm it. And um, some of those he's, he's okayed to release today. Um, there's kind of a, a list of four, four or five messages to read. Uh, before I do that, the Lord said that he was going to give us small meals that we could digest and easily grasp. And I believe he's been doing that. He's been having me share more with my local community. Um, I feel like he's still preparing me for something still, um, developing, developing something in me and training me for something. Um, but you know, he's been asking me to speak more in front of the church and things like that. And there's still some wrestling that goes on. Uh, but, He's been faithful and given me the courage and the boldness that I need to to be obedient to him And so I've been sharing more with my own community on Facebook and I've been copying those and sharing them to the community page on YouTube with all of you as well and uh, I know that maybe not all of you see that or even know how to access that so um, I'm going to read those and some of you don't like doing all that reading you know they're kind of long and um so I'm going to read those out loud and some videos coming up so you can look for that he's had me attach some some videos to those messages and so I will I will do that in a video format and attach those in the notes or the comments the videos that from before that he attached to the messages kind of bringing a more fullness of understanding to some things that we um you know some of the videos that he had me make in the past and so again he says that we're we're doing by practicing and, and he just keeps taking me deeper and deeper and further and further along in this journey it's awesome that you're here experiencing that with me and uh, I know it's encouraged a lot of you to uh, jump in uh, to Christ fully into the Christ life and uh, experience your own journey with the Lord and so that's what this is all about is he said you know I wouldn't I wouldn't keep the best for myself, that I would reward others through my inheritance in Christ Jesus. And, you know, that's the law of multiplication. When, when a person's willing to share what, what they've inherited through Christ, um, their testimony with others, it, it multiplies Jesus in the, in the world. And so uh, that's why this channel exists. And, um, and it's really fun to hear your, your testimonies. And, um, and you've just been awesome. You've been an awesome body of believers to grow with. And I love you all very much, and I look forward to seeing you in the comments. I look forward to um, sharing these stories with you and uh, just celebrating the goodness of God with you along the way. It's been great. So thank you very much. So to be honest with you, a couple of these messages might be a repeat. They feel like they are, some of them. Um, 
But he just kind of gave me a list of them, and typically when I've read a message, I kind of put a check mark at the top just to remind myself that I have read that one. Um, I have three binders of messages, you know, that I've, I've shared on this channel, and um, it's actually <laughs> when he had me post some older videos, I go back and I watch them, I read the comments, I'm like, wow, I do not have a good memory. Um, I'm amazed at how what he said in the message connects so completely with with the recording and uh, all of it, I didn't really even remember. And um, but anyway, some of these messages did not have a check mark, but it sort of felt like I've read them before. I don't know. But anyway, this one is from October fifth, and this is where he wants me to start. I had a little sticky note that said snares on it. I circled the word snares, and I might have read it in that last video I made when I shared a vision of a of a person being caught up and kind of a snare, enemy snare, but uh, I'm going to read it again. Hi daughter, hello Lord. Melissa, today you will deliver words to the people. Tell them I am a mighty God, mighty to save. All they have to do is cry out to me and I will hear their cries. I am going to deliver them from the enemy, from the snares that hold them captive. I will deliver the lost and show them the way everlasting. My children will soon see me in the clouds. I will rescue them from this dark kingdom and deliver them to my home in the sky. They will be able to escape the coming war and be held in safety by my right hand. I will not let them be harmed. They will seek the lost and help spread the good news until my return. They will release my power on the earth and they will see many miracles bursting forth. The days ahead are for the lost to re rediscover the truth of my existence. The days ahead will bring many to their knees. They will see that I have never left them, but have desired them the whole time. I am not a God of wrath and destruction, but of love and forgiveness. The hour though will come when the dark kingdom will be eliminated from this world. The idols will be torn down and a new kingdom will be established in, in the and a new kingdom will be established to the ends of the earth. There will not be any darkness, just the truth of my name. I will show the world something new, and it will stand. My kingdom will never fail. Melissa, you will soon see how I reveal these truths to the entire universe. I will begin soon to remove the veil that has darkened the skies and the eyes of people. Do not fear, sons and daughters. Look forward with hope and longing for the day of your deliverance from this prison. You will be made new in completion, and you will radiate with light and love for all time. Sing to me, the day is here. And then there was some scripture with that, again, that um, in the notes, if you want to pause it and look at the scripture uh, from October 5th, I will list it there for you. So I just want to take a moment and do a little commentary. You know, something that I've learned as I've journeyed with the Lord is just starting to understand the revelation he wants to give up to our spirit and have our spirit teach our soul, but how often it's easy to filter the words I receive through my mind and the doctrine I've been taught. And, um, you know, I am a firm believer that the Lord is not going to speak anything that contradicts his own word. But I've been challenged sometimes in my understanding and interpretation of the word. Have I understood it correctly? Uh, has my interpretation of it been correct? And I hear all different types of interpretation, you know. And all I can do is stand on, um, on the promises the Lord's given me to try to my best to walk in obedience with the portion that he's given me. And I'm not going to say that I understand everything that he, he says correctly. And sometimes I might misrepresent what he's saying because I don't even know it always. But sometimes I'm filtering things through my mind and my, my understanding, whether it's right or wrong. So, um, you know, along the, in this journey, some things have been coming to light. And I've been, he's been waking me up slowly to some truths that I didn't uh, really rightly understand before. One thing is, you know, I think there's going to be different levels of 
tribulation, it's going to get really bad. I don't believe, based on what he's saying to me, that we're going to be here for the worst of it. I do believe, though, that we are going to be here for some of it. Because, you know, I, I've had to be delivered, and I think some of you can relate to this, to that escapist mentality that, you know, one time I said a prayer, I'm saved, and so as soon as the end comes, I'm just going to be snatched out of here. And, uh, you know, the Lord has commissioned us, you know, commissioned. He wants to journey with us to uh, proclaim his gospel on the earth. And he has a job for us to do. And he appointed us to the season for a reason. And I'm starting to see that he's bringing us to maturity in this wilderness, bringing these things to surface, bringing these false uh, ideas and doctrines to surface and revealing to us kind of our, our selfishness <laughs> and wanting to just escape some hardship and not having anything required of us whatsoever. And I'm starting to see that he has a job and a purpose, you know, and, and uh, he has a good, pleasing, and perfect will. And the perfect will requires us to walk in obedience, um, even when we can't really fully understand or see how it's going to be possible. Um, but I see that there's going to be some dark times ahead and, um, and that he's, he's training us up for that, to, um, to be a light in the world when it gets dark. And so that's just something that uh, slowly is, is dawning on me. And, um, and I feel him preparing me for that in and, and deeper and deeper ways. So I just wanted to mention that here before I go to the next one. So this one is about the Eiffel Tower. And I mentioned this before. Um, you know, when I first received this word, I thought it was so strange. And I was like, Lord, I felt uncomfortable, you know, sharing it at that time. And he spoke to that here. And, um, you know, just like you said, I no longer feel uncomfortable with it. I, I, I have spent time thinking about this. He kind of planted the seed of this. And over time, I've, I've grown to understand more. I don't think I understand it fully, but I've, I'm comfortable and not fearing um, that this is as crazy as I originally thought when I first received it. Um, so October 8th. Doesn't he have such patience with us? Oh, thank you, Lord, for your patience. And your unconditional love. October 8th. Hear me, daughter. Come to me. Come home to my love. You are drawing ever closer and tighter to my side. You're going to deliver messages again for a time. Do not fear, dear one. The last days are going to seem but a few for those longing for my return. I am almost ready to deliver my people from this place of bondage and dread. I am going to cut the chains that bind and set the captives free. The hour of my return is here. The day of my coming is at hand. I am going to show the world that I have loved them with an everlasting love. I have sought them and I have toiled on their behalf. I have gone to great lengths to draw them to my side. They will see the truth in this, and their hearts will open to my peace and my love. I will deliver on every word spoken to my chosen few, and I will begin immediately. I have already started. The news is revealing to the world the hour and the season. Yes, I am doing a mighty work in the hearts of man. I am doing the necessary work for man to again seek me, to seek my face, and cry out for mercy. I long to deliver those who cry out to me. I am a God of promises. I do not hold back my love. I do not destroy, but I do tear down idols. I do eliminate strongholds, and I do break down walls and barriers. I am going to rescue the lost, and I am going to redeem the broken. I am going to address the issues that bind and defeat and corrupt. My people will rise up and they will have victory in my name. They will no longer settle for counterfeit glory. They will choose the way everlasting and they will conquer the enemy and live in freedom. Let's begin to talk about the greatest established building in history, the Eiffel Tower. This symbol of strength was erected to show the world that man can craft something out of his own ingenuity. But the Eiffel Tower does not come close to my ability 
to erect hearts and save lives. I am going to lift my people up to heights unheard. I am going to display them throughout the earth. They will start, I'm sorry, they will stand high above the rest and be symbols of glory throughout the earth. They will be visited by many and be witnessed as something to marvel at. Do not wonder at these words, daughter. You will soon see. You do not need to fear. I am going to show you the relevance soon. Soon you will be able to deliver this message with confidence. The day of my return will capture the attention of the world, and they will no longer desire to run from me, but to me. They will come to their senses, and they will repent of their transgressions. I am going to shower blessings and favor on my obedient ones, and they will not be able to contain the words I put in their mouths. They will proclaim my name, and they will light the path. They will lead the lost back into my arms. I am about to move in a mighty way, like the world has never seen. I am going to transform the way people think and see and experience this world. It will be turned upside down for my glory. It will be done. Listen, daughter. I am beginning this new chapter, and it is going to be good. Wait expect expectantly and in good faith for the day of my return. Do not lose your joy or your generous spirit. Keep doing the work of your Father and rest in his love. Go in faith and hope for the coming of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Rest now, daughter. Rest in this, knowing that all will come to pass, and you can take me at my word. And that, again, was a message from October 8th. I will put the scripture for that in the notes if you want to pause and take a look at that. So when I first received this word, I really questioned, is the Eiffel Tower really the greatest established building in history? Because there's some pretty amazing buildings. What makes the Eiffel Tower the greatest one? You know, I was just researching it and, you know, I learned some things. And I'm sure that the Lord has even more meaning that hasn't been revealed to me in all of this, why he chose the Eiffel Tower. But my first uh, impression was, wow, this kind of sounds like, you know, the Tower of Babel. Uh, man's own ingenuity, you know, reaching heavenward up into the sky. And, um, but as I was researching it, I found out the Eiffel Tower is the most iconic structure in the world and most recognized structure and that more people have visited the Eiffel Tower than any other building in the world. So I was like, okay. And um, I learned that the Eiffel Tower, um, that the man that built it, Eiffel, he used the tower for studies in astronomy, radio, meteorology, and aerodynamics. And that his uh, structure is among those secretly um, that are also awesome transformers. So I was just thinking about all of that and just like, wow, um, you know, used for a radio, used as a transformer. You know, the, our body is the temple of the Lord and, um, and our ability to hear him, hear the Lord is, is so mysterious. You know, even the angels like to watch us and marvel at this, that we are in relationship with an unseen God and uh, can hear from him and uh, obey him. And that is pretty awesome. And that does uh, outweigh the ingenuity of man as he built the, uh, the Eiffel Tower for all of the various purposes that it was, it was used for and still stands as something to marvel at and that everybody recognizes, doesn't even compare, you know, to what the Lord's done in restoring his presence back to his people and our ability to communicate with him is awesome. All right, this next one at the very top, it says, it's from October 9th, it says, the temple mountain of the Lord. You know, the Lord's talked to me about the the mountain of the Lord, and I, I feel like I've grown in my understanding of that, but I also have lots of questions and what exactly he's trying to teach me in that. Um, I, I feel like I keep learning something different, something new. Um, so let's see. This one, I think I'll start here. Melissa, do not fear. I am sovereign over all. I am doing a mighty work in all the earth. 
It is beginning to wake up from its slumber. It is beginning to come back to true life and belief in me. There are many that will not awaken until the greatest shaking of all time is underway. But there are many designated to awaken at this time before the greatest shaking of all time begins. My child, the days ahead are going to threaten the people who have invested all of their treasures in the temporal. They, you see, they will begin to shake with fear, but the ones who have stood I'm sorry, they will begin to shake with fear, but the ones who have stored their treasures in heaven will rejoice and be glad. The time of my great return is at hand. The whole earth will soon see the splendor and the glory and the truth of this everlasting kingdom. Daughter, the days ahead are filled with hope and expectation as I complete this final chapter. Do not fear, but wait in patience and in surrender to the plan as it unfolds on the earth. The plan to bring the whole world to its knees in acknowledgement of the King, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And then this part was for me, but I think I'll go ahead and read it. Do not deliver this message today, but prepare to share testimony about the mountain of the Lord. You will see how this influences the coming messages. Daughter, you are on track, do not fear. I'm holding you and you continue to do this work set before you to do. The path is narrow, daughter, but you have discovered it because of the roadway by the wilderness I led you to. And then uh, there's some scripture. Again, that message was from October 9th. And the scripture, if you want to pause it and look at that, that will be in the notes for you. Remember, sometimes the scripture goes so perfectly with the message that he gives us, and then sometimes the scripture is like this overarching theme that's been throughout this entire journey. And um, I'm amazed at how he keeps developing some of some of that uh, through all of this, and just opening my eyes to the 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 lesson he's trying to teach me behind some of these scriptures that are repetitive. And in the beginning, people would say, you know, these, this scripture doesn't go with this message at all, but they keep coming up and it's like an overarching journey um, that is, is kind of uh, threaded throughout this whole time. And, um, and it's just awesome. And I am, you know, in those times of doubts, like the, the scripture that I receive sometimes is the hardest part because I don't see the connection. I didn't understand. But now looking back at all of it and seeing, I'm like, wow, Lord, even in that, you know, my feelings of doubt and, and the complaints of others, you know, and, and their doubt uh, didn't matter. You're still faithful. It doesn't affect your faithfulness. Like you're, you're still doing something the way that you want to do it. And I give you permission to be God. I give you permission to do it the way that you want to do it, not um, based on the way I think it should be done. Um, you know, part of that lesson the other day really put that into perspective that when we complain to the Lord, it's such a direct affront to him and his sovereignty um, that we think that he should do it a different way, that he should do it the way we think um, is is really confrontational and um, to, to the Lord and his sovereignty. Uh, his ways are way higher. Um, and, but he still, you know, through that, he still works and he still surfaces those things. That's probably the point of it is, you know, that he is going to do it the way he's going to do it. And he's going to do it, uh, with or without our permission and with or without our, um, our uh, submission to it and our, uh, receiving of it. And so I just more and more, I want to just surrender and say, Lord, have your way, however you want to do it, whatever it looks like, you know? I want to um, just surrender to the, your plan, your purposes, the way you see best. And I want to learn from you and grow in wisdom and um, enjoy the journey that you've put into place, if that makes sense. Before I go into this next one, while I'm think of, thinking of it for a second, I know that some of the videos have been in a different format. And, uh, you know, I've been wondering about that too, why the Lord's having me do that. Um, you know, as I make those videos with the Lord, I don't really know how they're going to come together. He just, 
gives me a starting point and it's like he teaches me through it which it's been a really cool experience um, I've really enjoyed it it's different um, and so by the end of it I feel like I've been on a journey with the Lord and he taught me all these things and brought all these things together and it's kind of like in scripture it says um, when he was talking to the disciples and he said you know I'm gonna be sending you a counselor the Holy Spirit is gonna remind you of all the things that you've been taught and you know I, I I felt like the Lord was like pouring so much into me. I was like taking notes and it, it's just a big mess in my house. Like, and then when I read the notes, I don't remember um, exactly the revelation, you know, and I, I was panicking for a little bit about that. But then when I sat down to make these videos of the Lord, the Holy Spirit was bringing to remembrance very specific things and organizing it all. And it was just like, wow that's what he was talking about when he talked to the disciples like he's taught me things along the journey and I didn't have to fear you know it wasn't in my own power and my own striving that any of that came about it was just the Holy Spirit bringing to remembrance um, the things that were planted in there and uh, it's all the work of him and I know that some of you don't really enjoy that format some of you do some of you don't I didn't even put my you know, my picture on it. So I don't think even some people even recognize that it was from this channel. Uh, they don't get a lot of views, you know, which is fine. You know, um, it's not about that. It's about the journey and it gets to the people that's meant to get to. But I've been wondering, you know, in doing those things, they're stored in my computer. And so if I don't have internet, if the internet goes down, this is a thought I had the other day. If the internet goes down, those are things that can be used as a teaching tool without the internet so my computer could still be used and so I'm wondering if that has if that's part of his purpose in it and so you know some of you want me to to read or to um, you know you're saying you're just giving me feedback that it's it's a hard format for you to learn from and um, and I and but not to you know change things based on you and your reaction to it which I understand and I appreciate your feedback but also what I want to say to that is I, I just, regardless of what we think or how we think it should go, you know, I'm just stepping out in obedience to what he's asking me to do. And he knows why. And so um, I'm just trusting him in that. And, uh, you know, in those videos, I think that was meals for us. They were gra things that could be grasped and they're shorter. And, um, you know, I, I think maybe for my community, those are videos I'm sharing on Facebook. It might be easier for people to receive that know me without seeing my face. Because it's it's difficult, you know, for people who have known me my whole life um, to transition with me to this, this um, faith journey. Uh, they know me in my soulish, fleshly life, you know, and they know me from childhood. They know, and so it's maybe harder for them to receive from me. And so maybe some of that was for my community so that they could receive in a way that uh, wasn't my face and kind of blocking them from receiving what the Lord was speaking through me to them, if that makes sense. So those are just some thoughts I had in a, as I was flipping to this. I'm like, oh, I should share that here before I forget that. All right, so this word is from uh, the 15th. And in a few messages that I've received, he's referred to this boat, this idea of the boat and him being the captain and different things. And I, I've always thought that was kind of curious. And you know, it reminds me of the Ark, of course, as, as a major boat and a, a symbol of um, the, the Tower of Refuge, you know, and when tribulation's going on, being protected. And we've learned that it's really awesome, but the same word for pitch, the whole Ark was covered in pitch. The same word in Hebrew is, um, is the word atonement. And so it's like, wow, that really is connecting the ark to Jesus Christ. And uh, some people think it's a picture of rapture, of being protected from tribulation, um, things like that. So just the, it's interesting that he's used the boat analogy in some of these words. And I haven't always understood it. And again, my reaction at first to the things I didn't understand, filtering it through my soulish mind was, uh, that's crazy. And I don't think that came from God. But over time... Um, and he's brought me, you know, through some of that wilderness to a place of where I can step out in faith with a little more confidence and courage and trust um, that he's not going to forsake me, that he is leading this journey um, with or without my total mental uh, acceptance of every part of it. 
and he he's faithful and uh, is bringing me along in maturity and building my character and building my trust you know as we journey December 15th hear me daughter write these words I am going to bring even the hardest of hearts back to my love I will deliver the word I will deliver the world back to a place of knowing. I am the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Sing songs of gladness. I am going to feed my sheep. They will eat these words. Melissa, the coming days are going to show many the truth of who I am. However, there will be some who refuse to believe they are the one. However, there will be some who refuse to believe. They are the ones who do not become all that was prepared for them to become. They had plans and purposes and destiny callings, but chose to follow gods of their own making. December 15th. Hear me, daughter. Write these words. I am going to bring even the hardest of hearts back to my love. I will deliver the world back to a place of knowing. I am the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Sing songs of, sing songs of gladness. I am going to feed my sheep. They will eat these words. Melissa, the coming days are going to show many the truth of who I am. However, there will be some who refuse to believe. They are the ones who do not become all that was prepared for them to become. They had plans and purposes and destiny callings, but chose to follow gods of their own making. They chose to worship the adversary and lift up idols and deceiving spirits above the one true God. Melissa, for them is eternal suffering. For them is condemnation because they refused to let go of their sinful ways. I do not wish for one to perish. All that is not of me will be tested and tried. It will be put through the fire. Only the bronze, silver, and gold was to be taken from Jericho because the rest was not going to glorify my name. Melissa, begin to see now that all of my creation is to glorify my name. Man has made idols and has crafted many ways to exalt himself in all he has made. He has delved deeply into the created. He has allowed imaginations to create views and considered these views as truth. Melissa, all of this will be put through the fire. I am about to rock the boat. A tidal wave will wash over the earth and man will see the truth of who I am. He will see worshipers worshiping in spirit and in truth. The wave will cleanse. It will grow and it will crash over the false doctrines and the heresy. It will break down the strongholds and set captives free. Many will return and will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How lovely are the feet of them who bring good news. The good news is to be shared. It is to be passed on. It is to be shouted from the rooftops. You have a savior. You have sonship. You have a home. This world was never meant to be your home. You are being birthed, delivered into something much bigger and better and more perfect and glorious than your veiled minds can comprehend. It will be good. It will be all you will ever want and need. His presence will envelop you. Love, perfect love, it casts away all fear. You will be at home and at peace. You will never look back. You will be rescued and redeemed and made new. Sons and daughters, I am coming. I am coming like a thief in the night to those not ready. Make yourselves ready, therefore, by emptying out your homes, your temple of all that is not me. I love you, sons and daughters. I have loved you with an everlasting love. You are safely held. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. All will be made new. A time of refreshing, a time of cleansing, a time of rebirth. Go ye therefore into all the nations and share this good news. I am coming. I am the one who was and is and is to come. I am the Lord Jesus Christ and I will rescue the lost. I will pardon their sins. Repent, for the new day has dawned. I am at the door. Yeshua, Hamashiach, the Lord God has spoken. And there's a list of scripture that goes with that. Again, that one is from December 15th. If you want to pause and go and uh, see the scripture there, I will put that in the notes for you. Okay, this next one is from 
uh, December 24th and this is one that I had kind of a red flag on and I put on the shelf and I just said Lord if this is from you I know you will confirm it when this came through uh, it just caused me a lot of confusion and um, just some some doubt like Lord this doesn't really sound like you if this is you I know you're gonna confirm it and uh, show me what you mean <laughs> in time and um, this one says, My child, deliver these words to the nations. Tell them I am doing a mighty work in all the earth. Tell them I am setting the clock back to start. Tell them I am dividing time and gathering people back to my arms. Do not fear, daughter. You are hearing my words. Do not wonder whether or not you are receiving correctly. I am directing your pen, Melissa. Listen to me now. I am going to bring the mothership back to port. She will operate and bring loads of passengers into my kingdom. The leaders of the nations are going to soon be revealed as not holding the keys to a better future. You will soon see how many leaders are being informed by the enemy. They are about to be delivered to the media and the people will begin to see real changes in the earth. The barriers will begin to crumble and the truth will be visible. Even so, the enemy will continue to lie and deceive many. The enemy will begin to create even greater deception, and many will be fooled. Many will be the victims of lies. Melissa, the day of my return is but moments away. I am going to bring many home. I am going to begin a mighty work in the earth. I am going to show the world that the hour is at hand. Melissa, will you be able to utter these words to my people? Will you speak my name in all the earth, or will you cower in fear? I want you to stand in authority and begin to build my kingdom, for the hour is at hand. I want you to begin again, and this time I want you to show them and teach them about the law of love and the destiny of sonship. I want you to teach them about the mysteries and the revelation and the coming days. I love you, daughter. Do not be afraid. I'm going to help you succeed at this, and I'm going to give you what you need when you need it. Rest in me. And uh, if you want to pause there and look at the scripture, that again was from, or I'm sorry, December 24th. The scripture will be in the notes for you. So when I received that word, um, a couple things alarmed me. Turning the clock back to start was strange. Um, saying the mothership sounded extraterrestrial. It sounded outer spacey. Um, and am I going to cower in fear? Fear. It sounded like a confrontation. Um, it sounded like condemnation to me a little bit. And uh, we know that that spirit comes from the enemy. And so I just wrestled with some of that and um, thought, I don't know, Lord, I don't know if that was from you or what that was. If that was a mixture of things, I didn't know. And um, so, you know, I guess what I want to say about that is turning the clock back to start. It's interesting that he's asking me to read that, you know, right now, right before Passover. And I've just recently learned that time was set back to start at Passover during Moses' time he told him to begin the the festival year in Nisan from then on that would be the first of the year in the spring and he changed time he set it back to start and that Passover on the 10th, um, they would bring the lamb into the home, and on the 14th, uh, they would they would do their preparations for Passover and all of that. And uh, that's how it would be from then on. It's still like that today. And on Passover, you know, during the Passover celebration, Jesus was crucified. And what happened to time then? There's a before and after Jesus Christ for the nations. The whole Our whole timeline is based on Jesus Christ and what happened at Passover. And the clock being set back to start back to zero, you know, start it over again. And so I'm just like, wow, that has so much significance in this hour for me when at first I thought it sounded like a bunch of craziness. I didn't understand it at all. Um, but 
again, the same lesson. Like, it doesn't matter about my emotions and my feelings. God has his way of doing things, and it's it's way bigger <laughs> than I can imagine. And, um, you know, when we don't understand something, our first reaction is to get afraid. And that's part of the wilderness is, is confronting that fear and taking captive those fears and saying, no, you know, the Lord is faithful. He is going to finish what he started. I'm going to stand on the promises he's given me. I'm going to walk in faith. I'm going to share this boldly. You know, I'm not a coward anymore, Lord. Thank you. Um, you've given me a spirit of boldness. I'm going to take those thoughts captive and I'm going to make them submit to the truth and to um, what I am stepping into in faith. And I'm going to, um, I'm not going to be the reason that uh, the perfect will for my life is, is not lived out. Even if I don't understand everything, I'm going to still walk in faith and take those fears captive and make them submit. Because um, the only thing that can get in the way of his perfect will being done in my life is my fear and my disobedience and my grumbling and my complaining. Um, nothing else. He says to work. All, he's going to work all things out for good. So even if I'm messing up, even if I'm making mistakes, even if other people are making mistakes around me and trying to hurt me or whatever, he's going to use all of it and the, those purposes are still going to come to uh, completion. So the next part is the mothership. So again, we have this idea of a ship, but it sounds um, extraterrestrial. It sounds kind of um, otherworldly, you know? Maybe he said that by design. And... Uh, so this is, this is the amazing testimony I want to share with you. There's this family that came to interview. Um, some of you followed this journey for a while and are familiar with some of the families I talk about. A family that goes to our home church in the evenings, they run, a, um, they're kind of missionaries from Guatemala. Um, they lived there for, you know, 12 years or something, and they've come back here to the States and they run this healing farm. There are family counselors, but all kinds of people come to this beautiful property just for a retreat to get spiritual healing, um, to get counseling for their families for various reasons. There's lots of missionaries that come just to refresh. Uh, people from all over the place come, all over the world. We meet all kinds of interesting people through this this place. And um, the the couple that were doing the maintenance on the grounds they, they were retired uh, mis missionaries also from Guatemala. So they're a family that's connected. They knew each other. They work well together. And so um, they both, you know, came back to the United States. And, and this couple is like, they might be 80 or they're nearing their 80s. So it's time for them to retire. And so they helped out at this place for a few years, uh, but they have moved on to retirement. And so they're trying to fill their role and they've been interviewing all kinds of families and um, this one family just really seems like a good fit. They have a number of children and uh, the man has kind of a remote job. He uh, he can do it all by computer. He, he designs um, things. He uh, basically makes blueprints for construction. So he worked in construction for a long time but um, now he just does the computer blueprint part of it and um, you know writing up things for code and all of that. So he was able, the interview process, you know, it was a three week thing. They wanted them to come and stay for three weeks and they had lots of meetings with this family and just discussing lots of things and uh, kind of the vision for the future of this healing place. Um, they want to expand and add more buildings, different things. Well, this family is way too big to live in this little cottage that the, the, um, the retired couple were living in. So that was an issue and um, they just were trying to see if their visions aligned you know this this family really wants to have a lot of farm animals they want to have a wheat field they want to you know live off the land completely and uh they have goals for their own family so they're just trying to see if their goals match the goals of this organization and i don't know that they ever arrived at a decision but they do know that the lord this family knows that the lord told them to move and that this area seemed like the place that they were being called to so they didn't know if they were just going to like meet us and just be a part of our church or they don't really know exactly what the Lord had in store for them so they were just kind of seeking that out and so uh, one night we took 
dinner over to this family, got to know them. My husband and this man had so much in common, you know, um, just the things they're interested in. You know, they both love to butcher their own animals and um, they just had lots to talk about that way and they're both in construction and uh, it was kind of neat. And um, we invited them over to our house and the day that they came over, the wife wasn't feeling well and so she stayed home with her baby and um, the husband brought his kids and they played with their son and we just really had really good conversation with him and we were talking for a while and then all of a sudden it was like everything switched, it was just time to go, you know. Um, I think the kids had a bedtime and they, he just wanted to get home. And so we are getting everything, getting all the kids organized and getting moving toward the door and all of a sudden he just stops in the doorway and he looks at me and he tells me about this vision it seemed really random kind of like slapped me in the face a little bit like stunned me that for some reason it's like he had to tell me this vision before he left and um so the vision was he he was um driving his motorcycle trying to beat a storm this is true he really was driving his motorcycle trying to beat a storm and not get rained on and as he was driving he had this vision but he couldn't tell if it was real or if it was a vision he knew rationally it couldn't be real but he was perceiving it as reality he saw um, a giant ship a ship so big that he said the masts went up into the clouds. It was taller than Mount Everest. He has a son that he named Everest. So he said it was taller than Mount Everest. So I knew it couldn't be real, but I saw the masts going up into the heavens and I'm driving toward this thing. I'm driving toward it, I pass it, and I have to, even though the storm's coming, I have to turn around and go back and see if it's still there. And it was still there. He goes, but I know it was a vision, but I was perceiving it like it was real. And I look over and he has one of his sons. I noticed for the first time the shirt his son was wearing was a ship. It was a sailboat, a big sailboat with the number six on it. And six is the number for man. And I just thought, Lord, did you just send me a messenger? Like, is that why this family's here at my house right now? Did you send me a messenger to confirm this message about the mothership? And I just was like blown away by this. I'm like, is that what's happening right now, Lord? And um, I took a picture of this boy's shirt. I'm going to share it with you. But it also reminded me of, I don't know if all of you have seen, but the Lord gave me like one of the most awesome experiences with the Lord. He took me progressively through this dream and this revelation of this dream that I had. I was in a boat and I was in Europe. I knew I was in England and I was traveling under a bridge and on that bridge, while I was in this boat, I look up and somebody is holding a sign with the number six on it. And that was the dream. And um, there were some scenes before that. I don't know if I've shared those or not. I need to sometime. But um, I had just changed clothes. I was still wet trying to get fresh clothes on, which is interesting. I, I was getting prepared for something. Getting dressed for an event. So, um, but anyway, in this scene, I was going into this bridge in a boat, another boat. And um, he, over time, showed me, he said, uh, I said, Lord, can, I was recording that. And I said, you know, I need to ask the Lord for a revelation on that. I don't think I've ever asked him for revelation. The next day I had a dream. And the dream was, um, I just, not a dream, but I woke up with a song, um, Moon River, playing in my mind, which, you know, I've taught dance for a lot of years. I'm very familiar with that song. Uh, it's a waltz, and um, it, it says, you know, we'll be crossing the rainbow's end, my huckleberry friend. And um, and then he showed me where this dream took place. He said that the number six represented a revival that's going to spread from Thailand, which I have since looked up Thailand, and they have been having massive revival there. They've been baptizing um, busloads of people and from an aerial view they dress the people baptizing dress in like rainbow colors and they stand in rows like a rainbow and they baptize these people thousands and thousands in Thailand have been coming back to the Lord over the last couple of years and I was like 
the rainbow. And, the, and somehow this revival is going to spread from Thailand to the Netherlands, to the Baltic region. And he gave me this rainbow's end, one end to the other. There's um, some Baltic states that go to the Netherlands and, and revival is going to go um, travel to that area. And I've been looking at the Netherlands and, and revival is happening. It hasn't happened in all the states there, but it, there is revival happening in the Netherlands. So I've been kind of following. And so where this was taking place in the Tyne River, there's two bridges like a double rainbow. They look like a rainbow. And at night, it's lit up. It looks like the throne of God. It looks like um, streets made of gold and it, like a rainbow. And I had a video of all of this. Uh, I'll put it in the notes if you want to look at it if you haven't seen it. And um, and in my dream, when I was going under the bridge and somebody was holding up six, there was a small group of people in a kitchen waiting for me. And when I looked up, right around the bend, the second bridge is called Millennial Bridge. So when you cross that bridge to the Millennium, the Millennial Bridge, the one that looks like a rainbow, the promise, um, in real life, there's a factory, a flour mill, and when I looked it up, the architect of that flour mill, his name is Kitchen. And in my dream, there was a kitchen of people waiting for me. And so this has really challenged me. I've listened to different things. I've always believed, and I don't know that I don't believe this, but this is some things I'm just wrestling with, that the bride of Christ gets raptured. But this whole ship, I'm starting to see like, the ship is kind of like the lower part, the big massive part is being kind of like the outer court of the temple. And then the masts that the guy saw up in the heavens are like the the inner court and then the holy of holies. And that's more the narrow way, you know? And like the, the broad gate, many enter through it, is the outer court. And judgment's going to be brought to the outer court. Jesus brought judgment to the outer, outer court because it was so mixed with the world. And he wants us to find the narrow way. He wants us to get into the inner court, to go to the Holy of Holies, to find his perfect will. That's kind of like the barley harvest, you know, um, where where the, 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 the flesh is separated easily. It's just tossed into the wind and it's separated. Then the, the wheat harvest takes some grinding. And then the grape harvest is like the wrath, you know, it's the stomping. But all of it's intended to bring people to repentance and and to a truth and to an understanding of who God is and he's perfect love and to fall in love with him and to see truth for what it is. What's challenging me is in scripture it says that the, the, the New Jerusalem is lowered down as if it's a bride adorned for her groom. What I'm wondering and um, wrestling with and just kind of kicking around, what if all of this is the bride? What if the the banquet is when we enter into millennium or at the end of millennium, when even after all that's done, when the new Jerusalem does come down fully, we have a new heaven, new earth, what if that's the wedding feast? I don't know. Um, that's just something I was thinking of based on that dream and based on different things and pulling some things together in scripture. Um, you know, I, I do believe in the rapture, and I, I do think there are different harvests and different raptures. Um, you know, in Revelation, we see three groups of people. We see the true worshipers. We see the 144,000 with the marks on their heads. It's like a mantle is passed to them. They have some kind of evangelical role. They can hear the songs the new the worshipers are singing. He says to me in these messages a lot, sing to me a new song, and it's connected to that somehow. And then we have the souls that are co collecting on, under the altar, I think in Revelation 6. They don't have bodies yet. Um, and, and they're saying, Lord, when are you going to avenge us? When are you going to avenge, you know, they're taking our lives. And um, when are you going to make that right? And he says, you know, when the fullness of, of this group is brought in. And then they get the new bodies and they're the priests. They're the ones who are beheaded. And I'm looking at things like Elijah and Elisha, you know, Elijah, Elisha was Elijah's disciple, and Elisha wanted a double portion. 
Elijah got to be raptured and he said, unless you see me go, I can't promise that, but unless you see me go, then you'll get a double portion. So what does that mean? Well, when Elisha saw Elijah raptured, he, re he received the mantle, he received a double portion, and he did even greater works than Elijah did. But he, he died a very ordinary life, you know, an ordinary death. It wasn't anything like Elijah got to be raptured, but Elisha was the greater, received the greater anointing and did even more. So that's interesting. But it's similar and kind of is a shadow of Jesus. He said the same thing. He said, you know, unless I go, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to do even greater things than I did. And so it kind of is a shadow of that. It, um, he left and Pentecost came and there was an outpouring and people were even getting healed in the shadows of Peter. Great things were happening. And prophecies pattern. And, and so what does that mean for us? Does it mean like the raptured people and the people that see the raptured people go receive an even greater outpouring? I don't know. Um, and then the mantles passed on and the 144,000 received a passing on the mantle. They get, you know, and, um, and then I'm thinking about John and Peter and Peter, he didn't really like John was the one who Jesus loved. And, um, John was a really humble man. He doesn't even like talk about himself or name himself in the gospels, but he does say he's the one Jesus loved. And that sounds like, is that arrogant? Why did he say that? He mentions himself as the one Jesus loved five times, and he mentioned um, Lazarus as the one Jesus loved, who was raised from the dead uh, once. And, um, you know, the dead in Christ will ride, rise first. And I just don't know if John represents that. Um, he was living fully in the intimacy of Jesus while he was here. And Peter really talked boastfully, but he wasn't matured yet to the thing that God was, you know, kind of was having his wilderness experience and didn't know it. God knew what was in his heart. Peter didn't even know. But when he was out in the world, he denied Christ three times. You know, when he was out in the outer court, he denied Christ. He's in the outer court. And John was, where was he? He was at the cross. He was not ashamed of God. He just wanted to be where Jesus was. He was at the cross. He was the first one to arrive at the tomb. He beat Peter there. We waited for Peter to get there before he entered, which is interesting. What does that mean? What does John represent? What does Peter represent? Peter represents, to me, the church in the outer court that denies Christ. They think that they um, would never deny Christ, but when the pressure's put on, they did, and or Peter did, and he didn't. Um, he didn't really come to understand and have his personal encounter with the love of Jesus until after the event, until after Jesus was crucified, until after. He rose from the dead, and then Jesus came and he, he redeemed it. He he reconciled his relationship. He took it past forgiveness. He reconciled it personally with Peter and took him to the beach and said, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yeah, Lord, of course I do. No, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. And then he gets it. He gets it that Peter is back at the original place where he was called on the Sea of Galilee, on the shore of Galilee, and he just falls down and says, Lord, Now I see, now I love you. And Jesus said, okay, now go feed my sheep. So once he had his own profound encounter with the Lord's love, then he was ready to go feed the sheep. And Peter went on to do wonderful things, but Peter's always a little jealous of John. You know, John's like laying on, on Jesus, and Peter wanted to be the special guy, but he was a little jealous. You know, he had some wilderness stuff going on. He had jealousy and comparison and everything. So there's John, John's always hanging around Jesus you know, wanting to be close to him every moment. And so John's even here in this scene. John is following along and he, and Peter says, and Jesus just told Peter the death he was going to die for his glory. And John, Peter looks back at John and says, what about him? How's he going to die? And Jesus says, what's it to you if he's still alive at my return? You just follow me, Peter. You don't worry about him. You follow me. All of these people, James, John, and Peter, were part of the inner circle. Isn't it interesting that there's three of them, part of Jesus' inner circle? They were always with him in those intimate moments. He had a purpose for each one of them. They all died differently, 
John outlived them all. He wrote Revelation, all of that. And uh, James was the first to die. I just wonder what that means, if it has any correlation to the three groups in heaven um, that we see, the ones, true worshippers standing on the glassy sea, the 144,000, and the priests that get the white robes that are beheaded. They all have a role to play in the, in the end, and there's purposes for each of them. And so these are just some things that, you know, I'm wondering about. In my dream, when I crossed the Millennial Bridge, it was a kitchen with just a few people in it. And a kitchen can represent, you know, a place where meals are made. So part of me is wondering, is all of this preparation for whatever job I have in the Millennial, in the Millennium? Is this all preparation for what I'm being birthed into? A kitchen is a place where meals are prepared, where sermons are prepared, where food for others is prepared. Is that going to be my job? Or is that representing the feast and the banquet of the bride? I don't know. So these are just some things I'm kicking around. But how awesome. How awesome. Um, I know he's going to tell me what I need to know as I need to know it. But that's just where I am on that. He, just interesting he told me to share that with you today. And I just wanted to kind of share some of those wrestlings and some of those, um, some of those insights I feel like the Lord's given me. Um... I don't know that he's giving me all the answers, but he's at least pointing me in directions of things to think about and drawing things out of scripture that I hadn't seen before. I did want to say I was uh, scribbling down that man told me you know that vision I was scribbling it down on this piece of paper and I just wanted to read some of the things on this paper preach good news heal broken-hearted set captives free heal the sight uh, heal blindness and then on the other side mountain of his presence a city on a hill, lighthouse, guiding, attracting in the storm. On this rock, I will build my church. <laughs> this is from like a month ago. To feed hungry, give drink to thirsty in a dry and weary land. This in the wilderness. Rescue the lost, create thirst and hunger or reveal it in others. Sales first create a need and then they meet the need. The counterfeit glory. There is a real need, and there is a real answer. We are members of his very own body, chosen for good works before the foundations were laid. Go to the ends of the earth with him to spread the news. Orphans and widows, don't let the world get on you. It's for all nations. These are just some notes from something. I don't know, but as I read this and remember everything we just talked about, it touches on so much of it. 
so that's just interesting that I scribbled it on this piece of paper. I don't know where this came from or what those were notes from. Um, but to me, I hear so much confirmation in those notes. I don't know if you hear it all, but I hope so. All right, there's one final word I'm going to read from February 25th, and that's where the video is going to end today. All right, as I was looking for this word, he said uh, in my spirit to tell you he has loved you with an everlasting love, and he is coming for you soon. The spirit feeds on the word of God, as written in the margins. February 25th. Hello, daughter. I said, hello, Lord. Melissa, do not fear. I'm here holding you in this hour. I am sustaining you with my words. I am giving you the food you require. I am allowing you to digest and grow. Hear me, daughter. I am spirit. I am truth. I am giving you life through the words I speak to you. I am the milk and the honey. I am the bread and the wine. I am. Feast on me. Go to the ends of the earth with me and proclaim my words and feed my people. I will direct your path. I will make the way straight for you. I love you, my child. You will continue to be a blessing to the nations we have not even begun. The adventure of a lifetime is coming. Do not fear. I am preparing you and revealing to you what is needed. I am going to do it. It is already done. Rest in me and let me show you the way. Rest in me and I will also rest in you. My work is finished. Is there anything, I said, is there anything, is there anything else, Lord? Melissa, you are faithful and you are giving me more and more of your heart. Keep coming, my child. I will never leave you or forsake you. Put all of your trust in me. Obey me. Follow me. I will lead you to your destinations. Rest in me. Abide in me. And I will rest in you. Abide in you. Thank you, Lord. I understand now. Give it all to me, Melissa. All of your desires are met in me. All of your hunger is satisfied by me. Worship in spirit and in truth. We shared a meal at the cross because that is where your new life began. That is where you began to receive. Hear me. I am in you. I surround you. I am ever before you. You are mine and I am yours. Prepare a meal for others. Feed them these words. My children, you are my chosen vessels. You are carefully designed by your maker to do the good works of the Father. You are going to begin to deliver masses from the darkness. You are my lamps. Begin to see with my eyes. Begin to wait on me and listen. I am leading you. I am beside you. I am ahead of you preparing the way. Trust in me. Lean on me. Do not give up one step at a time. I am ever preparing you, teaching you as you wrestle and wonder. I am, your, I am in your thoughts. I am in your words. I am in your desires. Pay attention. Look for me in all things. Seek me with all of your heart. I love you. You are my dearly beloved. You are mine and I am yours for all time. Keep coming. Keep loving. Keep believing. Keep hoping. In all things, stay fixed on me. I will make your path straight. Find time for me in the stillness. Listen for the faintest whisper. I am he. Go now and move mountains in my name. Set captives free. Deliver the good news and remember who it is who lives. Come and worship. Lord, is there anything else? And he gave a list of scripture that I will put in the, in the notes. So this is a message that um, I actually recorded in front of the cross. It, it came out of the, the experience I had with the Lord the night he told me to get a piece of bread and meet him at the cross. I made a video about that. And um, I read this again in a, in a message that he showed me to, told me to post at the end of everything. And so that's just saved in my phone for whenever he says to release that. So you will hear that message again. And... Um, but he wanted me to put it here for you too. I read the personal part just because he has personal words like that for you too. He has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you. He has a perfect will for you. Books written about you before you even uh, came to be. And so he's, he's just calling you to step into that if you haven't already. And um, one step at a time, one little baby step at a time, he's going to lead you to your destinations. He has big plans for you to uh, to be instruments for him to, to rescue the lost and build the kingdom. So, hope there's something for you in this message. And uh, 
I look forward to seeing you in the next one. God bless you. I hope you have a great Saturday, or what, what is today, Sunday, or whenever you're watching this video. Uh, have, a, have a great day, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. I love you.